scripture this morning obviously has to do with the sermon, which is on joy. Let's start by reading Romans 15, thir- the verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Next we turn to James 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And our third verse, Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And the last scripture for this morning is John 16, verse 24. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. I get everything out of my way. Good morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you today. And we thank you for this chance to once again be in your house with your people. And Lord, we just ask that you pour out your spirit upon this service and just open our eyes and our hearts and our ears to what you have to say this morning. And all these things we ask in your name. Amen. Today I do want to talk about joy. And I want to talk about the difference between being happy and having joy. There's a difference. There's definitely a difference between being happy and and always having joy. You know, it seems like we're always looking for happiness or contentment. That's kind of our job. That's kind of what we do. Um, Let me see. I'll try to get this straight. When you're, as a child, when you're just just a little kid, you'll be happy when you start school. You know, if I, when I get to start school, I'm going to be happy. That's going to make me happy. And then when you finally get to elementary school, when I get to middle school, I'll be happy. Well, once you get to middle school, then you're, you're thinking, well, once I get to high school, I'll be happy. And then when you get to high school, when I'm a senior, I'm going to be happy. And then once you're a senior, you think, well, when I get to college, I'm really going to be happy. And then, you know... Especially when you go to college and you get away from mom and dad, that, you know, you think I'm going to be happy. And then you think when I graduate college, I'm going to be happy. And then you think when I meet the right one, when I meet her or may, I meet him, it'll be the right one, I'll be happy. And then you get, once we're married, I'll be happy. And if you were here last week, you'd know that's not always true because my, my wife has YouTube and she saw the sermon from last week, so... Uh, but anyway, no, but when, you get ha- when we get married, I'll be happy. And then you and your wife, you know, when we have children, we'll be happy. That's when we'll be happy. And then when those kids go to school, we'll be happy. And then when those kids go away to college, we'll finally be happy. That's when we'll, we'll try- know true happiness. And then when we have grandchildren we'll be happy. And finally, when that nurse brings me red jello, I'm going to be happy. (laughs) You see, we're always looking just to get happier and happier. But, you know, there's a difference between being happy and having joy. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness is really, it is fleeting. Happiness, you know, I'm happy you're here today. I'm happy I can make it. You know, chocolate makes me happy. Yes, it does, doesn't it not? Or they're not happy campers. You know, a happy, you know, happy is all about the circumstances we're in. Joy is a way of life. Joy is a way of life. I think I told you, and I, well, I know I told you, I grew up in a very Southern Baptist house, and I was born on a Wednesday, I was in church on Sunday. It was that quick. And I mean, if the doors of the church were open, we were there. 
When the church, you know, when the preacher decided to wash windows, we found our favorite pew and watched him do it. We were there. We didn't miss a Sunday. But if I was sick, if first, you know, if I ever got sick and couldn't go to church on Sunday, we watched church on TV. And so I'll never forget, this is one, if I don't learn anything else on TV, I learned this. I was watching, I was at home, I was probably eight or nine, and Robert Shuler, remember Robert Shuler? The glass cathedral? At the time it wasn't glass. But, it, you know, that was many years ago. But I was watching Robert Shuler with my mother, because dad went to church. And uh, he said, if you want true joy in your life, you got to remember three things. Just remember the letters of joy. It's J-O-Y. It's Jesus, others, and then yourself. And you will know joy. If you can remember that, if you can keep that order, Jesus, others, yourself, you will, you will find joy. And that stuck with me. That stuck with me, for, well, obviously for several years, at least 15, 20. But anyway, it's been a while. But I remember joy. I, I remember that. And the, um, but, you know, the funny thing is, you know, we're always searching for joy. And the, um, but very few of us, very few of us are doing anything what we thought we, we'd be doing when we were 12 years old. I don't know about you, but I'm not doing anything close to what I thought I'd be doing when I was 12. I knew I wouldn't be up here when I was 12, but I'm neither a shortstop for the Yankees. I'm obviously not on the PGA Tour. And as far as you know, I'm not a ninja. So I'm nowhere near doing what I'm, I thought I'd be doing when I was 12 years old. And to be perfectly honest, I think women win when it comes to doing what they thought they would be doing when they get older. Uh, if you take away the whole princess ballerina thing, if you did a poll of, of high school kids and asked them what they thought they would be doing in 10 years, I bet women come closer. I bet women come closer. Um, my wife wanted to go to Appalachian from the time she was in the eighth grade. She wanted to be a social worker from the time she's in the ninth grade. Guess what? She went to Appalachian, she's a social worker. I told you, I wanted to play for the Yankees, and during the off season, I wanted to play on tour. And when I turned 50, I thought I'd play on the senior tour. I'm now 52, and the closest thing I've gotten to any of this is an AARP card. That's the closest thing to the senior tour I've seen. I carry it with me when I play golf, so I guess I'm really, I'm close. I'm really close, but, you know, some of us, though, are still searching. We're still searching, not only for happiness, but for that real true joy. Um, you know, it's funny because when we ask kids what they want to be when they grow up, we don't really care. We're just looking for ideas. If you think about it, that's, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because I would love to know. You know, I, I, I'm looking for an idea. But, uh, but, you know, once we grow up, we find out that it's not so much about what we want to do, but what we need to do or what we have to do. That was the realization I fell into when I got older and got married and started having, after the first child comes, it's no longer what do I want to do, it's what do I have to do? What do I need to do? Um, we're providers. When we grow, you know, that's, when you know you're a grown up is when you get a large appliance for Christmas. <laughs> that's when I realized I was a grown up. I'll never forget that Christmas. We got a washer and a dryer and it was just, mm, I'm a grown up. No more toys, no more anything. It's just, um, but in the movie, The Rookie, there's a, with Dennis Quaid, he's a, he lost his dream of being a pitcher because he hurt his shoulder. He wanted to be a major league pitcher, but he hurt his shoulder. But through some odd circumstances, he got a second chance. And he went to go ask his dad what he thought. And his dad said, uh, son, there are things we want to do. And there's things that we should do. And that made a lot of sense to me. Now, he went on to pitch. He didn't listen to a thing his dad said, but he went on to play. But I understood that. I get that. There's things that we, we want to do, and there's things that we should do. There's plenty of things we'd, we'd love to do, but we can't because there's things that we should do. But no matter if we are in our dream career or we're just trying to provide for our families, joy is still obtainable. And I found that out. Joy is still obtainable. 
If our family is safe and happy, there's joy in that. My dad always said, I want you to have more than I did when I grow up, when you grow up. I want you to have more than I did when, I, when you grow up. Now, my dad didn't say he didn't want me to have to work or that he didn't want me to have to earn a living. He just wanted me to have more than, I, than he had when he was growing up. And, you know, wanting more for your child, first and foremost, should be, that's like the top, the top five things of what parents should want for their children. You know, we, we need to be a Christian example for our children. We need to make sure they're safe, make sure they're happy. We wanted them to have more than we ever had. You know, and we want to be in a Christian example of a husband or a wife for our, for our children to see. That should be the top, that's five of the top ten things for our kids as an adult that, you know, we should represent to our kids. You know, six through ten involve hitting and throwing a ball, so we won't even get into those. But our Father in heaven wants so much for us. And all we have to do is ask. There's joy. Joy is obtainable. And God wants to give it to us. He's not going to, you know, flash the Powerball numbers up in the clouds. You can forget that. But John 3.16 says he gave up his son for us so that we can spend eternity with him. And all we have to do is ask him. All we have to do is ask for that relationship. And we can have joy. Not only do we get a heavenly home, but we get a heavenly father to lean on. You know, not only do we get to go to heaven when we leave this earth, but we, for the rest of our lives, we get to lean on him. We get to lean on our Father in heaven. See, we tend to equate happiness with joy, but they are two totally different ideas, and each one of them spring or come from a different source, if you think about it. Happiness comes from the world around us, and the other originates directly from the spirit of our living God. You know, happiness is conditioned by how uh, it's conditioned by and often dependent upon what is happening to us. If people are treating me well, if I'm having a good day, then I'm happy. But if things aren't going my way and the circumstances aren't favorable for me, then I'm unhappy. In Galatians 4.15, Paul said, where is your joy? You know, we could ask a lot of this from, the, from churches in our area, where is the joy gone? Where is the joy gone? So what's taken our joy? There's a few things that can take our joy from us. One of them is unrealized expectations or lack of con contentment. Um, I found this and I loved it because if you'll listen to this, you'll see that how Paul discovered the secret of being content. Um, in Philippians 4.12, it says, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or, or in want. I think it's interesting that Paul calls contentment or joy a secret. He's had to learn how to live with expectations, with unsatisfied expectations. Likewise, we've got to learn with plenty. You know, we have to learn to live with plenty or with little. You know, contentment doesn't come when we have everything we want. But when we want everything we have is when you'll find contentment. Joy is not opening a present on Christmas morning. It's watching someone else open a present. That's joy. That's joy. You know, another thing that robs us of joy is unresolved conflict. Our joy evaporates when we allow conflict between us and someone else to just eat away at our joy. When someone, when someone does something to us, it occupies our mental, it occupies our emotional, it occupies our, our spiritual focus on what it should be. You know, we have little left over for God when we're so mad at somebody else or we're, you know, we, we've got a conflict going on with somebody. We let that just eat away at our joy. In Hebrews 12, 14, it challenges us not to allow relational ruptures to fester. It says, make every effort to live in, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up it to cause trouble and defile many. And thirdly, unconfessed sin. 
will take away joy. Unconfessed sin is probably the biggest joy robber there is. Guilt can gut our joy faster than anything. You know, sin can send joy so far away. Uh, David in Psalms wrote, Blessed is he who, whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin, who sin the Lord does not count against him. I love how this psalm ends when David owns up to his own sin and his joy returns. It says, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad. Sing all of you are, who are upright in the Lord. You know, if you catch that, David, you know what David did. You know where David's been through. He was not able to rejoice. He was not able to have joy until he confessed his sins before the Lord and was able to dance and sing before the Lord. So unrealized expectations, unresolved conflicts, and unconfessed sin can take all of our joy out of our life. So what's keeping us from joy? What is keeping me individually, you individually, what's keeping us as a church from joy? If it's unrealized expectations, ask God why he has you where you're at. If you, no, I'm not teeing it up every Sunday with Phil and Jordan and Jason, but that's all right. Where I'm at, I get to open my door to my employees, and they know who I am, they know what I am. I've been able to pray with people. I've witnessed to people. I've seen people come to know Jesus where I'm at. And so I know why I'm where I'm at. I know, you know, God doesn't make mistakes. I'm there for a reason. You know, I'm, uh, it's not what I thought I'd be doing when I was 12 years old, but it's where God wants me to be. And that's where I had to find contentment in what I do. When I saw the first person that I'd ever witnessed to, actually I had a guy that worked for me, he worked in our shipping department, and he was, turned in his two weeks notice and he found another job and I was, and I was happy for him. He found a, a really good job in High Point, and he gave me his two weeks' notice. And before he left, I was like, I was passing him in the plant. He was like, well, I'll, I'll be back to see you sometime. And I'm like, okay. And before I could get to the other end of the plant, the Holy Spirit turned me around. I said, can I talk to you for one minute? Well, I talked to him for 35 minutes. And I brought him in my office, and I witnessed to him. And I told him about, I told him about Jesus. And we walked down the Roman road a little bit together, and and when he left, he goes, well, he goes, I really, I really want to talk to you more about this. And I said, well, I really don't want you to leave before you've you made a decision to follow Christ. And he goes, well, I want you to talk to me and my girlfriend. And he said, I know where you live. Can we come by and see you tonight? And I was like, sure. But I, you know, I still wanted to, I didn't want him to leave. I'm Baptist. I, you never know where there's a Mack truck around the corner. And if you grew up Baptist, you'll understand exactly what that means. But if you... Baptists are scared to death of Mack trucks for those of you that don't know that. But anyway, so I was really worried about him. And that night, I sat at home and I waited. And I waited. And he never showed up. And I really felt bad because I witnessed to him for 35 minutes and I thought, I lost him. I've absolutely lost him. And then I got a call about two weeks later. I was just leaving work. I was getting in my car. My phone rang and it was him. And I've never heard him sound this way. I mean, he sounded giddy. He sounded happy. And he was like, you'll never guess what happened last night. And I'm like, what? And he goes, we went to a revival and I got saved. Well, praise God. You see, it wasn't for me to lead him to Christ that day. You know, we, the Bible talks about some will water. You know what I mean? Some will sow. All I did was water a little bit. God let me water that day. So I know where I'm at. So I don't, you know, sure, I would love to be sitting on the bench for the Yankees. I don't even want to play, just sit on the bench. But I know where I, God has me, where he's got me. If it's unresolved conflicts, settle it. That's the only way you're going to find joy. Even if you're right. Even if you're right. And of course, we're always right. But if you're, even if you're right, be the bigger person, apologize, and move on. It's that easy. Just take one for the team, and joy will come back. I had two, two ladies that worked for me for a while, and they're both Latino, and they and speak very little English. And they, they understand you know, several, you know, a few words, and, I can, and one of them speaks a little better than the other one does, but one of them really didn't speak a lot of English at all. 
And they got into a little argument, and it lasted for three and a half years. <laughs> they were the only two that could speak to each other and didn't speak to each other. I mean, that was the only person they could really carry on a conversation with and couldn't do it because they let that conflict just ruin everything. Well, one of them got very sick, and she got cancer, and she got very sick, and she was working out her last little bit. Well, the other one, you know, apologized, and they got back together, and, and for the last three months, that, that lady worked there. They were two of the best friends. But they wasted three and a half years because of, well, actually, it was because of work, because, of, you know, one of them didn't want to do that and made the other one do it. And it lasted for three and a half years and didn't talk to each other for three and a half years. Don't, don't let joy, don't let your joy go because of that. And if it's unconfessed sin, that's the easy one. That's the easy one. All you have to do is, that, all we have to do is go to our Father in Heaven. All we have to do is say, forgive me. That'll bring joy back. You know, this morning, we're going to open up the altar and we're going to, we're going to sing the last song and it's going to be in the hymn book, it is 347. Is that correct? And, and if you don't have joy because of unconfessed sin, then you can lay that down right here. You can lay it down where you're at. If it's conflict, then you can ask God to give you the strength to ask for forgiveness or to apologize. And of course, we can always go to God and say, you know, help me to remember why I'm at where I'm at. If it's, if it's contentment that you're looking for, then it's a good place just to go to God and say, God, why do you have me where you have me? And what can I do for you where I'm at? Let's stand.